Ariel, or Ariel, in the Hebrew name. There is a Hebrew name, and it has, it has uh, more than one translation. Haral in the Egyptian manuscripts, as well as the Hebrew manuscripts, means the altar hearth of God. And of course, um, a rash a is lion, so it can be the lion of God, which actually ar also can be city. So today, as we utilize it from the 29th chapter of Isaiah, it means the city of God, Jerusalem, but it also means the hearth of God. And I think, we, let's think on that a moment. What, what is a hearth? Well, many of you have got a fireplace that's got a hearth. A hearth in a furnace, which God's altar is in a sense, for he's a consuming fire, where he renders and uh, refines people's acts, such as whether it be of gold, silver, brass, uh, wood, or, or straw. So the hearth is the stone on which the precious ore is laid to separate the true gold, the real thing, from that that's fake. So uh, within this meaning, you have the sayings of Christ as well as Paul and others about testing God's children as by fire, okay, your deeds. So we see within this, uh, Ariel is God's return. And what this is going to be today is about his reclaiming Jerusalem and Lebanon, okay? Bringing them back into the fold. But what they experienced just prior to that, which you're in that time now. Prophecy is a beautiful thing when you look at it. And so I want you to open your mind in this prophet, prophecy and understand we're talking about the city of God, Jerusalem, the one that David named Jerusalem when it was named Jebus because the Jebusites had formed it an unclean birth as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 16. But yet God's favorite place on, in the universe, not just earth, the universe. And the place he intends to set up his eternal home when we go into the eons of time called by most heaven. Okay, so open your minds to the prophecies within this chapter because it will change subjects on you or have more than one meaning. And we will call on those as we go by. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29 reads, verse 1, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel the city which David, where David dwelt, where, where he lived. Add ye year to year and let them kill sacrifices. You let time go on over and over and let those holy days come to pass and keep celebrating them. But what God's letting you know, sooner or later, time's running out. Going to be time for a little change. So, and, and this is what, you know, God utilizes this. You know, if, if they're killing sacrifices, what are they doing? They're worshiping God, supposedly. I mean, they're, they're talking religion here, okay? He said, you just keep it up year after year and let her go there. Well, look at Jerusalem down through the years. The wars, rumors of wars, anxieties. Verse 2, yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. Now here you have to pick up on the dual meaning. In other words, let me, let me just reread that and translate it for you, what God is saying here, okay? Yet I will distress Jerusalem, the city of God, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as the hearth of my furnace, the hearth of my altar. In other words, I'm going to do some refining there. I'm going to pour the cup of wrath out. I'm going to straighten some people out. I'm going to get their attention. That's what he... Go ahead, year after year, keep on paying your sacrifices to me, but make sure they align with God's word. 
That's what he's saying in meaning. Verse 3, And I will camp against thee round about, and will lay siege against thee with a mount, and I will raise forts against thee. It means I'm going to conquer you, that geographical location. I'm going to take it over. I'm going to do it in. That is to say, as far as that that is bad is concerned. Here's where weak-minded people say, that scares me, that frightens me. Well, God's not angry at you. He's not talking to you here. He's talking to those that play church, those that like to play sacrifice, and, um, and yet they don't mean it, and they don't. David, I've got a little bit of a ring. Can you give me a little adjustment there? Those that play church and that just simply don't get around to serving God with their hearts, to mean it, okay, to take it seriously, to, to love Him and not be afraid of Him. He's not angry at you when you try, when you love Him. You don't have, you don't have one iota of fear that you should have aligned to His fire even though it be a consuming fire for some, to you it's the Holy Spirit. Have you ever felt the Holy Spirit? All it does is gently warms your heart, your mind, and leads you. That's all you have to fear from God. But if you're wicked, then watch out. Bernie, Bernie, okay? He, that's what he's talking about here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change some things, okay? It, for those that just keep burning sacrifices given to me, buying their way out, uh, so forth, okay? Uh, verse 4, And thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. It's going to twitter, peep, 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 peep. Nice religious things. You're going to be lower in a snake's belly. That's what he's saying. Let me just put it in good old Arkansas language. He said, you're going to be one sad sack because I'm bringing it down on you, and you're, not going, to, you're going to be ashamed. And uh, one that speaks with the familiar spirit, do you know what that is? That, that's demonics. Letting evil spirits enter into your family and around it, and you're supposed to be a Christian, and you allow it? When God has given you power over Satan and all of his operations, his, his uh, little buddies, and you don't take advantage of it, you just let them romp, well, they're just watching us do sacrifices, or oh, are they? Well, you're supposed to take charge. Be can-do type people. Don't put up with stuff. Yes, but Christians are supposed to be forgiving. Not to Satan. Who taught you that kind of stuff? You're forgiving to your loved ones, to your family, and people that try or are trying to do better, but you don't. Show kindness to Satan. He'll eat you alive. Okay? So beware familiar spirits. They're kind of trying to come back into the world today. And watch that whispering. You know? There's nothing hidden from God. And when they, especially if they whisper out of the dust. Okay? That's kind of like when somebody's supposed to go back to dust, you want to talk to them? Of course not. You know, not from the dust you don't. Verse 5, Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers, translate that enemies, okay? The multitude of thine enemies shall be like small dust, like blowing dust. There's going to be that many of them. And the multitude of the terrible ones, the tyrants, shall be as chaff that passeth away, yea, it shall be at an instant, suddenly. The word instant here is peta, and it means the wink of an eye. That should bring another scripture to mind to you. It should bring to mind 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. What happens at the wink of an eye, that we are changed. He said, it's going to end. There is a moment fixed in time that this is going to change. 
and I have every intention of changing it. He's letting, he's forewarning you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. And the, you don't have to worry. Even if your enemies are as thick as the dust, do you think that God isn't in control? You're a servant. What are you worried about? It doesn't matter how thick they are. It doesn't matter how many of them there are. We have the power. And that power is the authority that God has invested in us to control our lives, to be in charge of ourselves, lives, and to conquer that that is evil, whereby you stand above it. You don't have to worry about it. You're basically immune to it. You have been inoculated with an inoculation that Pro prohibits anything negative scorching you. That inoculation is called the Holy Spirit. And as long as you follow the Holy Spirit and take as it is written in St. John chapter 14, that he will remind you or call to mind your memory, all these things, if they get in your way, you'll know your unction will be to know when to, to stiffen your back and to straighten things out, okay? That's the way our Father operates. He has an instant in time, a blink of an eye. That's, that's what peta um, uh, in the Hebrew tongue means, uh, uh, like a wink, just that quick. It's going to happen. Too late to change minds then, my friend. Got it? Okay. But again, you don't have anything to worry about. He's your Father, and fathers do not hurt children that are obedient, all right? Uh, or correct them, I should say. Verse 6, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake. Have you ever wondered about those seven thunders in the book of Revelation? They're coming. And great noise and storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. And that devouring fire is our Father. So what are you worried about? If you say you're worried about God, then I feel sorry for you. You're, you just don't understand his love toward you when you serve him. He's not going to let something bother you. He's going to take care of it, that that you can't. He expects, he expects you to stomp little ants yourself, you, that you can take care of, okay? Don't let them get in your sugar, okay? And uh, you'll do fine. But what you can't take care of He'll take care of it for you, okay? Uh, that is, if you love him, that's up to you. You can play church all you want to, but leave his word out of the equation and allow familiar spirits to bring strange doctrines into your mind, and you're a lost soul. God will cut you off like he didn't want you, and you know something? He wouldn't. Verse 7, and the multitude of all the nations that fight against Erel, and here we have to translate it Jerusalem, okay, or Israel even if you would, and even all that fight against her and her munitions and that distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. It, it, all it's going to amount to is going to seem like all of her enemies is like they, it was a bad dream. Why? God's going to take care of business. He's going to clean house. Don't ever waste your time worrying or being frightened of what the future brings. You have the promises. You have the guarantee in the Son that He loves you and that He will take care of you. And that's just exactly the way you should treat the fear in your heart of the consuming fire. It's just a bad dream to those that don't love God. That's the way it's going to be, and it'll be worse than a bad dream to them, quite frankly. Verse 8, listen carefully. It shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awakeneth, and his soul, that's his nefesh, his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul, his nephesh, hath appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion, giving it the geographical location. Did you note something there? That 
their soul, when they wake up from all this sacrifice and listening to the whispers, their soul's empty. But there's nothing there. They have no debt. They're, they're, a, they're a sheep gone astray and they have not the comforter, the Holy Spirit. They have not that power and authority that he brings you, that he gives you. So just empty. But did you notice it said they do have an appetite? The second time when they wake up, they have an appetite. Are you able to solve that? Can you help that just a little bit? Have you got a little morsel of truth that you might assist them with, that you might help them just a little bit with? Because they're going to wake up hungry and wonder what happened. How, how was I misled? Why would I listen to the sayings of men and little whispers, you know, like on the Internet and stuff like that? You know, the Internet is, uh, can be used if you have a good mind. But if you get on and listen to garbage in, garbage out, you turn into garbage yourself. I mean, do you believe in documenting what someone says? Or do you, ex well, I saw it in print. Oh, well, great. Isn't that something? You know, let me sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. Let me give you a free trick ticket to hell, okay? Because that's where those things lead to. You have to document everything. Don't be, do, do you know what happens if you pass on garbage that you haven't documented? You're one of those that speak with an unfamiliar spirit. How do you think God feels toward you? If you're passing out undocumented garbage, to Christians trying to steal their souls. You're a spiritual murderer in God's eyes. That's pretty serious stuff, my friend. Make sure that what you pass out, what you teach others, that you've documented in the Word of God, that you're doing His will. No more, no less. In the simplicity in which Christ teaches, period. That's all. And we go with verse 9. Stay yourselves. I mean, hang on. Stay yourselves. And wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. How many people do you just walk up uh, at... Uh, in average, of not, not necessarily belonging to your church or of your faith, but you just walk up to on the street and start talking Bible with them. What do they know? I mean, I'm talking about this generation, okay, and many past as far as that's concerned. That they are in a stupor. And who put the stupor there? Verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. He's blinded them. In a sense, in that blindness comes innocency as far as worshiping in a Christ, which is we're about to get to here. As long as they're ignorant of the fact but you see, once you see the truth and you return back to the other, it's like a dog going back to his vomit, is the way Paul puts it. Or, or is it Peter? Whichever, okay? New Testament teaching. Or maybe I better correct it and say like an old sow returning to her wallow after you get her cleaned up and put a ribbon on her. You know? It, uh, it, that, that's what it's like, okay? Stay with your Father's Word. It's so simple. Again, a child can understand it. It's a matter of discipline in your mind, of, 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 uh, of taking, being the captain of your ship, and your ship is your body, okay, uh, and mind. Verse 11, And the vision of all is become, upon, become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, 
I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And naturally, you know, the, the, let's take the book of Revelations, which unlocks all of God's Word. It is sealed. It is sealed to some. But there are some that have, uh, who, who opens the seals for man? Okay. Chapter 6, the great book of Revelations, the Lamb of God opens the seals and explains them. Some of us have understood those seals for 50 years and longer. And for them, you're able to recognize the trumps when they come to pass. But you're not going to recognize them until you understand the seals. And then there is a given time that the four winds are released again. And that's what's important for this moment that we taught at Passover. And the four winds are loosed at the sixth trump. Okay, verse 12. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I'm not learned. I can't read. I don't know what it says. Why would somebody, when they knew they couldn't read, Say, read it. Because you've got some people that go around today saying, I didn't need a teacher. I've got the Holy Spirit teaching me every word of God's word, leading me. That's, that's a lie. You've got to, Christ is the living word. Once you study the word, the Holy Spirit will give you unction to understand. But this is the way people get off into fields of the unfamiliar spirit. Hearsay, traditions of men, rather than what is, what is I'll, I'll use an old uh, Saxon word, rote. Okay, that's, that's, that's what you have to learn by, uh, with the unction of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men, by the traditions of men. You know, this is why it's so important to teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That way you're studying God's Word and not the words of man. And do you know something? You would be surprised how many people have apparently didn't go to even a Sunday school class. Because if you say Eve did not eat an apple, there is, well, that's not true. It's right there in the book of God. Oh, well, show me where. It isn't, okay? It's not there. But they have listened to traditions of men for so long that they don't know what the Word of God says. And that's sad. That is really sad. Because he wrote this letter especially to you, his children. He wanted you to read it, not somebody else. He wanted you to read it. And to read it with understanding. In the simplicity in which he gave it. When you, if you were to take Titus chapter 1, which it only has, you know, verse 14... It tells you not to listen to the commandments of men. They'll mess you up. Okay. Verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people. Even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. They're going to be fooled. In other words, there's another place in Isaiah where it says, I'm going, all your leaders are going to have the minds of children and act like children. And so they do. And we see these prophecies as they come to pass. And we see many foolish things done. You know, like they will say, there's an, a, a debate going on at this time about sexual offenders. What should we do with them? Well, why not read your Bible? It says kill them. Hang them up. String them up. Do you know something? Your children are safe after that. 
And what does God say about it in Deuteronomy chapter 29? He says, 19 rather. Others will see and learn, and these things will stop happening among you. That's what you do about it. And many men said, well, Jesus changed that. No, he didn't. In Matthew chapter 5, he said, I haven't changed one jot. That's to say the sound of one letter of the law. And then he continues on, what is it, in about verse 25, 23, somewhere along in there. He says, you have heard that if one kill, well, you see, you need your strong concordance and you need to take that word kill back to the Greek and you find it's phonyance, which means commits a criminal homicide, they're going to burn. Their chances of burning are real good. That's what he says. Of course, God is the judge. We're not going to judge people. That's why there is a great white throne judgment. And that's when the final trial for a murderer takes place. Not here on earth. Okay. So, so Jesus... Uh, so what about the minds of people when they argue, well, we could give them life. No, we could put a, we could put a bracelet on them, you know, and, and we could track them. That way, maybe they couldn't hurt babies. Now, you put a bracelet around their neck and jerk it, okay? <laughs> then they can't hurt children any longer. That's what God's Word says to do with it. And some are going to say, where? Well, I told you, okay? Uh, Numbers 35 tells you what to do with them. But where, where are their minds? Why would you turn a predator like that loose on little kids and wonder how you're going to keep him from bothering them when you're going against God's word, against his law? What I'm saying is they have the minds of babes and, and no common sense. And it's written, all they had to do is read the letter that God has sent us. And you wouldn't have those things happening. I guarantee you, not by the same people, okay? They would not be around to participate, okay? Uh, verse 15, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? God does, okay? Always be honest with God. Uh, well, and, and you know something? There's not a one of us that doesn't do things at time, and you've got to kind of go to him and say, Lord, I think I messed up. As a matter of fact, I know I did, okay? And I just want you to forgive me and own uh, and so forth. Be honest with him. In other words, what, what can you hide from God when he knows what you're thinking? That, that's foolish to think you can hide something from God. That's why you want to always be open with him because he already knows. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say to him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing formed say of him that formed it, framed it rather? He had no understanding. He didn't know what he was doing. God made me, but he sure didn't know what he was doing. Now who would say something like that? You wouldn't have much pride within yourself, would you? And, uh, you know, God create, is the creator. We are the created. And God loves us. So you wouldn't want to argue with the potter when you're the clay, would you? And it even goes a little deeper in the Hebrew manuscripts. It said, who wants to change the potter himself and call him clay? I mean, that's, that's risque. You want to listen to your father. You know, as much as he loves you, as much as he wants that personal walk with you, to be in step with you, how could you be afraid of him? Or how could you, how could you want to argue with him when, when we get down to this uh, parable of the potter, you can't get any plainer of saying, he's it. He's in charge. It's going to happen the way he said it will. You know why? It's for our betterment. It's the best thing in the world for us is to go by his plan, not the plan of man, okay? And verse 17, it is not yet a very little while. Now listen to me, wake up for me. It is not yet a very little while in Lebanon. 
shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. In other words, that that you think is a fruitful field today when God returns and rejuvenates everything is going to seem like a forest compared to what it'll be like then. Beautiful. Wonderful. The, the uh, rejuvenation of this world. And as you could better understand then why Paul would say in Romans chapter 8, the creation itself groans for the day he returns and accomplishes just this. You want to watch Lebanon. God loves that place. What, what does it mean? When you say Lebanon, what are you saying? White. Okay? Because it's mountains. In the wintertime, why would they call those mountains white? Because they got snow <laughs> on the top, all right? And, and they're white with snow. And then why would you call them white in the springtime? Because there's limestone up there. And they're white, okay? So they named them White Mountain. And that's what Lebanon means. But most of all, because of what grows there. Satan always wanted to be one of those cedars of Lebanon, but all he was was a plain old box cedar. That's like one of them little old salt cedars you see down on Red River, okay? That got just a little old twisted scrub, okay? That's what Satan is in God's eyes. You know, not, not one of those gigantic cedars of Lebanon, that fragrance of fresh cedar, you know, that protects, even protects against insects and things of that nature. God loves Lebanon. But Lebanon has been called to the forefront here and in all end time prophecies. Right now today, for the last 30 years, the Syrian army, the old army of the Assyrian, if you'd like to really bring it up to date and think a little bit, has been their protector. Uh, how would you like to have a fox protecting your chicken house for 30 years? You know, you might come up missing some chickens, okay? Well, they've pulled out and it leaves a vacuum you're going to see problems from Hezbollah and many other things, no doubt, transpire in Lebanon at this time. It's a ticking time bomb. But watch it closely. God has his eye on the place. You're going to see things happen there. But right now, do you understand what I'm saying? Is basically they have no army to speak of, and they don't have all that strong a police force. So watch Lebanon. But the main thing is, know what's written. He's going to rejuvenate it. And it's going to be a fresh, wonderful place. Verse 18. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. And the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. God's going to pull back those scales and they're going to know and they're going to see the truth. You know when that is. It's at his return, of course. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor, that's to say the oppressed. Not, not, don't, don't translate it poor. It misleads you. Oppressed. Those that are oppressed by the bad happenings. Among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. It's a good day coming. It truly is. For the terrible one is brought to naught. The Antichrist is going to be done in. Zippo. Nothing. And the scorner is consumed and all that watch for iniquity are cut off. Those that like to plan uh, crime in the night. They're, they're, the fact that they watch means a wa they wake and watch in the night for an opportunity to do that that is evil. He says, I'm going to fix their wagon. I'm going to put a stop to it. Verse 21, that make a man an offender for a word. They're, they're misleading. They'll put something out there that is so untrue, and yet people will say, ah, did you read that? Not me, boy. And lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate. They try to rig judgeships. They try to bring wrong judges into power. And they boycott 
any judge that is a Christian, that loves the Lord, that loves the Word of God, where that we have a bunch of fake judges, and that they control things. They're the judgeship. That reproveth in the gate, that's, that's where judgment is done. That's what the saying means. And turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Uh, in confusion. The just, how can you fight that? Okay. Because of the confusion. Well, thank goodness through the Father you fight it and we win. Okay. Never be a defeatist when God has given you power and authority over all that's evil. Okay. You don't, you don't have anything to worry about. We win. Okay. Why? He's our Father. 22. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, that's the, all of the natural seed, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. He's going to be proud and he's going to be uh, serving our Father. Why? Because he understands the word now. It's open and they see clearly where they went wrong with understanding. And, you know, thank God for the remnant of God's elect that see the seals. And the seals have been broken and opened. And opened on some a long time ago so they could teach others and others could teach others. They keep breaking open. Opened by who? Man? No, by the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Uh, Revelation 6, 1. It wasn't angels that pass out seals. It's the Lamb of God. And he's been doing it for a long time. He paid an awesome price to be able to do that. He paid that price on the cross. And those that he opens their eyes to those seals, he expects them to utilize it. Verse 23. But when he seeth his children, this is to, um, the work of mine hands. When Jacob, the head of Israel, sees his children, the work of my hands. That's the potter talking, okay? That's our father. In the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They're, they're going to respect and revere me, not the false Christ. They're going to know the truth. They're not going to follow familiar spirits or gobbledygook. They're going to take the letter of God and read it chapter by chapter and verse by verse instead of traditions of men that make void the Word of God. It's coming, my friend. There's an instant, an instant, instant coming. Papa, the blink of an eye, that quick. Too late then to change minds. Be careful, my friend. Verse 24, they also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine, shall learn in the Hebrew an acceptable truth. And what is that acceptable truth? It's the Word of God. And the Word of God is so strong, so prevalent. Do you know something? It changes your life, beloved. It gives you strength and power and will to accomplish what God would have you accomplish, to be a comfort and a pleasure to mankind. Why? How do you comfort them? By giving them truth, solidity in life, not a bunch of foolishness, not a bunch of nonsense, not something that stirs trouble but solidifies life itself in the way that God created us to be happy, to understand, to know, and to lead and to direct through his word. Lebanon again comes to me in, in, a, in another scripture where God gives his name, Zach, in the great book of Hosea. Hosea means, the very word itself means salvation. Are you saved? Do you know how to find salvation? True salvation? Well, you, God told a story by using a man, Hosea, and told him to go marry a harlot that had a bunch of illegitimate children. And then by the harlot, he had a child or two. And, and within that story is locked the truth. Like 
the um, the uh, first child of the marriage was Gomer, and it means a a sowing or a scattering, like this. I'm going to scatter your children, Israel. And then there was a girl baby born, and he said, name her Lo Rohama. And Lo in Hebrew means not, no way. And Ruhama means mercy. What God is saying, there's not going to be any mercy here to these lost children. They're scattered. And, and then he, th there was a boy named, uh, born and named from this harlot. And uh, would you believe God told a man to go marry a harlot? Well, he did, okay? That's what the book of Hosea is about. And it means the Hebrew word salvation. Hosea, Yeshua. Okay, got it. Um, and um, he, he named the boy, he said, you name him Lo-Ami. Well, Ami in the Hebrew tongue means people. And Lo, not my people. They're scattered. They're talking against me. I don't want them in that light or in that where, where they are like that. Call them Lo-Ami, not my people. And then as, as Zechariah, in the great book of Hosea, as they come together, he said, you call her not lo Rahama, but you call her Rohama, mercy. I'm going to show mercy on her. She's my child. And then he said, you call lo Ami. Don't call him lo anymore, for they are my people. And he was gathering together. That's so that you understand where we're picking up here in the 14th chapter of the great book of salvation, Hosea, in the Minor Prophets. O Israel, return unto me, unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. I mean, by your faults. You messed up. Take with you words and turn to the Lord, say unto him, Take away all iniquity, sin. And receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. We're going to be with you, Father, because we love you. Verse 3, Asher shall not save us. The Assyrian wouldn't. And T. Asher is Satan, okay? There's no way that something wicked can save you. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the works of our hands. Ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. Who are the fatherless? The orphans. Those that are scattered. Those today that... How many people can read God's word and he says, I promise you I'm going to make Israel as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. And most people take one little tribe, Judah, and put all of God's children in that and they don't even know who they are. And where did they scatter? Why, why is it when you reach in your pocket, you pull out a coin that says, in God we trust? Okay. And why is it that God has blessed this nation as the only great superpower of the end times? Did he mess up? Did he forget something? No man did. That God leads his own. And God uh, chooses his own to follow him. Okay. They're, they were orphans. And that's the whole story of the book, these children by this harlot, because she went whoring after other gods. Verse 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Because of the wicked one, I, I, now I can love my children. Okay, I will be as the dew upon unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Boy, those old cedars' roots can reach out there and grab it, okay? They can be strong. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. That beautiful, fresh cedar. It's just, it d doesn't get any better, okay? They that dwell under the shadow shall return. They shall receive as the corn, revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the vine of Lebanon. God loves that place. Why? It's next to the very place he chose as his favorite spot in the universe. Again, you'll find that written in Ezekiel 16. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do anymore with idols? I have heard him, 
and observed him. Who, have he, who did he hear? God. And what did God say? Listen carefully. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. So God himself says, I'm like a great cedar. I'm like a great fir tree. Why? Well, uh, it's real simple. Find you a little old oak out here somewhere and tell me what happens to it in the wintertime. The leaves are not everlasting, are they? they? There's a little break. They dry up and blow away. And a lot of somebody's got to do some leaf raking. But an old evergreen is forever. And that's what God is saying. You know, a lot of people take a Christmas tree and put it in their house. And they don't know that God himself said, I'm a great evergreen. Okay, a great fir tree. Uh, the symbolism, yes. But freshness and the pureness of eternal and the symbolic of eternal life, there it is. Don't let idiots rob you of God's truth, of God's words. Verse 9, who is wise are you? Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just walk in them but the transgressors shall fall therein. It is written. He wrote it. He sent it to us. We have it. And we're to live by it. It's your choice. Your life. Your ship and you're the captain. And many, much advice will be poured upon you. Do you listen to it? Or do you listen to God's word? In your life, which comes first? Chatter and whispering are God's word. Who is the final boss? It better be God's word. because uh, Then you're going to be, I'm going to be looking at a happy person. But if you listen to the traditions of men that make void the word of God, I said make void. Do you know what make void means? It won't work for you. Prayers won't be answered. Well, I just, I just pray and pray and pray. Well, I, I, have you gone back to God's Word and, and thanked Him, repented totally? Have you anointed yourself in your home if it's sick? That's what He said to do. Have you done it? Oh, I, don't, I didn't know about that. Well, then read His letter. It's that simple. Okay. Anyway, you know, I thank our Father that we don't have to be afraid of anything other than fear itself. We know where to go. If, if there's trouble, we know how to do one of two things. You see, man only fears the unknown, all right? Now, when you know there's a big old tree coming up down here in the road, what are we going to do? Well, we can go over it, under it, around it, or we can saw that sucker in little pieces and throw it out of the road. You know? We can always plan and win. We can always take care of business, especially when we have his knowledge and his help. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word, for your truth, for this letter. Father, we thank you for the warnings you give us concerning the end times, and we will watch Lebanon. We will watch uh, Jerusalem at this time, Father, as your passages, that instant comes to pass, Father. We thank you for foreknowledge for prophecy in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Why are so many Bible scholars 
interpreting the Word of God, the same Bible, to believing in the rapture. After learning with Shepherd's Chapel, I no longer believe in the rapture. Well, God bless you. That's fine. And we, uh, it, we're not to judge other people. And it's, um, unfortunately, it's an easy out. In the year of 1830, when Margaret MacDonald had this vision of, of uh, speaking in tongues first and then the any moment doctrine, rapture, it, it was, it was a, a um, safety blanket and an easy out for preachers, and there was two of them standing there when she gave this delivery. And they brought then the so-called rapture into the Word. You don't have to learn God's Word. You're going to be gone. You're out of here. What a, what a lie. What, what a misleading, what a, a misnomer. When God makes it very clear that the false one comes first, we're going to be here, and what he has Christians for is to oppose him. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 makes it very clear. A child can read it with understanding if they'll listen to the Word of God rather than men's traditions. But that not everyone was to have eyes to see, as it is written in Romans chapter 11, God himself on a lot of people sent the spirit of slumber. And we can't remove that spirit. It's there, and it's going to stay there, okay, until the millennium. Then there's going to be a lot of eyes open. That's a time of salvation. It truly is. Uh, Lillian from, I don't know for sure where, don't know where Lillian's from. Uh, Shepherd's Chapel, to the question, how can one absorb all the different names of persons and places in the Old Testament? Um, you, don't, you don't have to, okay? You don't have to absorb them all. Um, it, uh, you, you have the, the Word. You can always go back and check. I suppose one of the best things you need to learn is how to use tools to find those words if you should ever need to. And um, that's why I so recommend the Strong's Concordance. It will help you find any word or name. And then the Smith's Bible Dictionary will give you the definition of, of what that name means usually or place or thing in whatever language, Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic. Uh, they're very handy tools for the English reader. Cherry from Nevada, would you please document where it talks about Jesus visiting those in, the, in hell after Jesus was crucified? Sure, be happy to. It's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, that he went all the way back to the time of Noah which that's where the deception first came uh, and, um, and uh, Enoch uh, began to teach and preach uh, what the deception of the fallen angels that were impregnating people and ab absolutely the innocency that God had brought into the world was being destroyed by Satan and his people. And um, so uh, he... but. Those people did not have the benefit of Yeshua, even though Yeshua was prophesied of even in chapter 3 of Genesis, verses 15 and 16. The fact that he would bruise the devil's head, okay? And, um, and so that's, that's when he went. And if you keep reading into the fourth chapter of First Peter, you will find that he was very successful because he freed a lot of them. In other words, it's the fairness of God. He gave the people back then the chance to accept Christ as their Savior and overcome even if they had fell there. Okay? Becky from California. What special studies do you recommend for young adults, teenagers? Well, uh, usually they like prophecy. That is to say, the... the um, Book of Revelation is an exciting book for them. And um, uh, when you talk and listen to the questions of the youth 
and when they ask a question, be able to answer it. You don't have to know just offhand, you know. Never be afraid of not knowing an answer. Find it. That's what makes studying exciting. You know, there, there are times I never close a teaching unless it happens to be for time or something else without opening up the, the whole uh, um, uh, platform to the public, giving them an opportunity to question or to make a statement or to have the right to ask me to document something that I might have taught. Um, and many might say, well, why do, you, why do you do that? Because I do not have a board that has the authority to tell me what I must teach. Okay, uh, that's one thing I have refused and is not in the bylaws of the Shepherd's Chapel that anyone can, uh, there, there's a group that can fire me, <laughs> but uh, they cannot give me regular, in other words, God's word is taught straight on, whether it, whether it burns me or somebody else, I don't care. The word's gonna be taught straight on and truthful. That's why God blesses the uh, ministry. But make it interesting for them. You could, you'll find out what they love and what they like. They like to know what's in it for them, and it's salvation. I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all a bunch because you enjoy studying our Father's Word uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, how exciting it is and, and how complete. Most of all, it causes God to love you. You're His child, and when you study His Word, it touches His heart, okay? We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, know what? He will always bless you. But there's one thing that is ever so important, and you must never forget it. Stay in the Word. I mean, just a little bit of time each day. Set it aside. Stay in the Word every day, and it's a good day. You know why? Jesus is the living Word. God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.